Coming up on this special edition of West Side Stories, we bring you an in-depth interview with the reporter who broke the Larry Nasser story. Indy Star investigative reporter and Grand Valley State University alumna Marissa Kwiatkowski describes how she uncovered Nasser's abuse of young woman gymnasts. We learn how Larry Nasser was able to fool so many people for so long. Next on West Side Stories. West Side Stories is produced by students from the Multimedia Journalism Program at Grand Valley State University. Support also comes from the School of Communications, inspiring thought, perfecting practice. Welcome to this special edition of West Side Stories. I'm Reagan Blissett. The USA Gymnastics story keeps getting bigger. Larry Nasser's old boss, former MSU Dean William Strample, has been charged with criminal sexual conduct. Strample oversaw the clinic where Nasser worked. Earlier this week, Indy Star reporter Marissa Kwiatkowski, the one who originally broke the USA Gymnastics story, sat down with GVSU professor Jeff Kelly Lowenstein to talk about how the investigation began and how she and two of her colleagues, Tim Evans and Mark Alicia, used court documents, interviews, and research to unveil Nasser's abuses. We'd like to show you part of that interview right now. Larry was this guy who was really good at not only, you know, being that nice guy and that friend to the people who are directly around him, but also the broader community and putting himself in a position of trust that so many people trusted him for so long and it made him easier, or I should say it made it easier for him to deflect these allegations when they did come up because, oh, that couldn't have been Larry, that would never happen. I mean, that came in the wake of our first piece about him that people were saying that as well. And, and so digging into all of those sorts of things, I think, um, you know, we explored not only how Larry became who he was in the sports community, but also the way that he manipulated everyone around him. There was a doctor that we interviewed who talked about how, you know, he started to believe that Larry was this expert because that's how Larry portrayed himself. He was always a speaker at conferences. He was always the one who was, you know, Talking about being a pelvic floor expert, he helped write a textbook. He positioned himself in this way to have people trust him. And, you know, he, he did with parents as well. He was their friend. He would help them out. He was the guy who, you know, when parents have busy schedules, he was the one who was like, hey, like, I'll stop by or you can come after hours. No worries. Don't worry about your schedule. And so, so many people for so long trusted that he was who he said he was. And I really think that for many people, it would be hard for them to believe the survivors today if not for the possession of child pornography charges. Mm. Because I think that really, for most people, turned the tide to say, this can't be explained away as medical treatment. This isn't, you know, there's no justification for that. And so I think that really changed the tone of the conversation. But it's also worth noting that he still got a lot of votes in the school board election, even though he lost. Can you just talk us through how the project began? I know that you got a tip, and I know you work on investigations, so you get all kinds of tips, but something about this tip got you from where you were and convinced you and your bosses to have you go on a plane to Georgia. What was it about that tip, and what did you get uh, in March of 2016? So I'd been working on an investigation into failures to report sexual abuse in schools. We'd had a number of local cases. And so I'd been doing a lot of work on failures to report sexual abuse allegations to authorities. And when I received the tip about USA Gymnastics, the source had told me that there was a time sensitivity issue there because the records might be sealed by the judge. So if I wanted to get access to the documents that were in Georgia, I would need to do so quickly. And as most reporters do, we try and find the cheapest way to do it in the beginning. <laughs> so um, I called the court. I tried to get them through the attorney. I tried to get them mailed to me. Mm. Uh, the court is a very small court in Effingham County, Georgia, so they don't accept credit cards. <laughs> they don't uh, accept personal checks or anything like that. So there was no really 
good way for me to get access to the documents quickly. So um, I called my bosses and I told them I thought that this was going to be important, that it could be significant, and they let me hop on a plane the same day. So I flew to Georgia the same day I got that initial tip about USA Gymnastics and um, flew into Atlanta, which was a poor life choice on my part because <laughs> it was much closer to the Savannah Airport, which I did not know at the time, but uh, I stayed in a hotel overnight and then I was at the court first thing in the morning mm -hmm. and um, picked up almost a thousand pages of documents that first day. Mm -hmm. and, and what were what were in those documents as you started pouring through them? Because that seemed like, especially in that first story, court documents were really a critical part of documenting what happened. They were incredibly important to launching our investigation because those documents showed what USA Gymnastics executives policy had been for many years for handling allegations of sexual abuse. And what we found through those pieces of depositions was that they dismissed a lot of allegations of sexual abuse as hearsay unless those complaints were signed by a victim, a victim's parent, or an eyewitness to the abuse. And if you know anything about sexual abuse, you know that, first of all, there's very, very rarely an eyewitness to the abuse that has happened, and that it's also incredibly rare to get a survivor who would be willing to come forward and sign a document, especially when you're talking about, in some cases, an eight, a nine, mm. or a 12-year-old gymnast. Mm. And so once you started looking at those documents, which were quite voluminous, as you said, when did you decide to bring in other team members? I know there's three of you from the reporting side that have really worked this project from the beginning. When did you decide to bring in the other team members? So there's a sense of urgency for us because we weren't sure whether other people might get the information that we had gotten. And so as soon as I got back from Georgia, my colleague Mark Alicia joined the investigation. And he was asked to join the investigation because he did a lot of investigations relating to sports business. So he had that aspect of expertise. And within a few weeks to a month, it was clear that two of us wasn't enough to get this done quickly because there was just so much information that we had to get through and, and get access to that Tim Evans joined the investigation. Tim has a long history as well of looking into welfare issues as I do, but he was doing consumer related investigations. So the three of us almost from the beginning were working together on this project. Well, and it sounds like you weren't only working together, but I know we're talk, calling this talk local reporting, national impact, but almost from the beginning, it sounds like it was national and that you were traveling all over the place to get documents, to interview people. Can you talk a little bit about that reporting process for that first story? So again, it helped, I think, in our investigation that we knew up front what their policy for handling sexual abuse allegations was. And so the next step for us was finding out how often did that policy come into play and what was the impact of that policy on the safety of children in the sport. And so we started requesting records all over the country. We started trying to background hundreds of coaches who were from all over the country. And we also connected with survivors and we started flying to various locations to interview survivors all over the country. And for us, when you talk about local and national, that intersection, USA Gymnastics is based in Indianapolis. And so that was really our local tie. There was also one of the coaches that we backgrounded, Marvin Sharp, who was a former Olympic coach um, and had been accused of taking pictures of underage gymnasts, um, was also locally based, but everything else was really all over the country. Yeah, and, and eventually from all that reporting, there were more than 50 coaches uh, that you found for that first story. Uh, but one of the most chilling details for me, Marissa, of that first story is that two lines in one of the depositions about a file and basically what USA Gymnastics did with allegations that they didn't consider uh, legitimate. Can you talk a little bit about just that file and that role in the whole process? So that's really important. So we'd actually backgrounded hundreds of coaches before we published the first piece our, in our investigation. The 54 files that you're talking about was what USA Gymnastics had compiled about 54 coaches. They were sexual misconduct files just over a 10 year period. So understand that anything that happened before that 10 year period or after that 10 year period was not included in that 54. Mm. But we knew that there were at least 54 sexual misconduct files on coaches that USA Gymnastics had access to. And in one of those depositions, that was an important 
point for us was that in some cases they would get a complaint about a predatory coach. They would look at it and they wouldn't investigate it. They wouldn't report it. They would just file it away into that system. And the first story uh, that, you, that you did as a team was really focused on that policy. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that decision? But there was also a companion piece about one gymnast, former gymnast, Becca Seaborn. And she talked about how years later, because of the abuse she had experienced, she would cringe whenever she saw a coach hug another gymnast after routine. Can you talk about that decision to focus on policy, but also why you had that story about Becca Seaborn, that very personal story? So it was important to us to make sure the public not only understood what was going on, but the human impact of those decisions that were being made. So we actually had a number of pieces that accompany that first story. Another one was actually about the lawsuit itself in Georgia to give people an understanding of what was happening there. Um, but Becca's story was really important and we did further stories on the gymnastics culture later. But her story was really important for us to tell because it showed how manipulative these coaches and officials in gymnastics can be when they're trying to prevent people from knowing about what they're doing. He had threatened her life, he'd threatened her parents' lives. He had accused people of various things, but at the same time, he was like two sides of a coin. So at the same time that he was really accusing, you know, threatening her if she said anything that she would get in trouble, he was also this charismatic guy that would go to hockey games with her parents and would travel with them to gymnastics meets. And so it, for us, was really important to help people understand the unique dynamics that were involved in gymnastics. Well, and, and after you ran that first story right before the Rio Olympics uh, began in 2016, from there, uh, Rachel Denhollander apparently contacted you through an email and, and said, this might be the first time somebody believes me. So the email from Rachel Denhander was actually just one of many that we had gotten in, within hours of our investigation publishing. The first piece published August 4th of 2016. And a couple hours after it posted, we received the email from Rachel that said, you know, she had read what we'd done and that she wanted to share her story, but that the person who had abused her was not a coach, he was a doctor. And at the time, what we did, because we got more than 20 of those alleging um, misconduct against various gymnastics officials, we divvied them up. So Mark and Tim and I each took a number of those tips to start digging into them further. But we really refocused our attention just on Larry when within a couple weeks we got two more reports of allegations against Larry. The first one was initially from a Jane Doe, she's since come public, Olympic medalist Jamie Dancher. And then a third individual as well, um, who has now become public, Jessica Howard. And when we got three different reports of allegations against the same individual, who, by the way, I think it's important to note, was had never been charged, had never been accused publicly. He was running for school board at the time. He was still working at Michigan State University. He was a beloved figure in the sport of gymnastics at the time that we were looking into him. But when we got those three separate reports, we shifted our attention and all three of us started working on the Larry Nasser investigation. And the first piece in that investigation published September 12th of 2016. And within a couple weeks of that, we had t more than 20 other people come forward with allegations against him. And today we have now more than 250 survivors have come forward. Mm -hmm. And can you talk a little bit about, uh, he, he was a, a much beloved figure in the sport. There's that uh, picture of him uh, reaching for Kerry Strug right before that iconic moment in the 96 Olympics. You know, he, he worked on her. Can you talk a little bit about the grooming process that he went through with the victims often over the course of a number of years? And then the process that you had to go through and the other members of the team in having the survivors trust you when they had, their trust had been so brutally abused? Well, it's important to understand that he, Larry Nasser didn't just groom the survivors. He also groomed his entire environment around him. Mm -hmm. So he portrayed himself and really cultivated this image as this medical expert, this pelvic floor expert. And he was very deliberate about conveying this. He was also the nice guy image. So 
for gymnasts and those in other sports, he was the guy that when they were being, you know, talked to aggressively by their coaches to try and push them to be their best, he was the one who would sneak them candy and who would be their confidant when they were talking to him. And also the fact that he was a doctor. We're talking about a, a guy who was known as, you know, the guy for gymnastics, sports medicine. And when you have somebody like that who's telling you that this procedure is necessary for you to get relief from this pain that you're suffering from or for you to be able to compete in the sport that you love, they trusted him. And uh, we're, we're honored to have the mothers of one of the survivors here with us, I, I believe in this session and also tonight. And one thing she talked about was how uh, she considered him a friend before this and kind of the, the grooming relationship that he had all around. Uh, that, that story uh, dropped, had, had tremendous impact. Uh, one of the things that I admire so much about your work, Marissa, is that commitment to give voice to those people who don't have voice. And to me, what was so powerful about the impact statements was, and afterwards, is seeing people who had felt silenced use their voice to speak at the impact statement, now to speak now for policy. Can you talk about that process? Then I'll turn to, turn to Kelly and make sure you, know, you have a chance to ask some questions as well. But can you just talk about that process of giving voice, but then people finding and using or having their voices come out again? Well, as you referenced earlier, you know, many of the people that we interviewed had tried to tell someone before that something was wrong. And they were either discouraged from reporting or they were told that they'd misunderstood his medical treatment. Or, you know, in some cases, they weren't believed by various people that they talked to. And so for us, it was important to upfront explain exactly what we were working on, why we wanted to speak to them, how their stories would be used, and why we were going to be asking certain detailed questions about their experiences. And um, I think you saw throughout this investigation and throughout that sentencing hearing the power of someone having a voice, because there weren't supposed to be 100. 56 survivors who testified mm -hmm. at that sentencing hearing, but every time that someone lent their voice and shared their story, it gave somebody else the strength to come forward and share their own. Mm -hmm. And you saw the power of that throughout those days as they kept adding days of sentencing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, Kelly, would you like to follow up? Yeah, so um, a lot of my kind of what I want to discuss with you is a lot of this isn't the first time this has happened, and this isn't an, an, an isolated incident that is happening here and isn't happening elsewhere. Do you think that there's a way to kind of change the narrative around uh, this stranger danger? Obviously don't trust strangers, but this is someone who was trusted and as you mentioned, a beloved figure, you know, kind of is there, do you, can you talk about a way to kind of how to use education around knowing what sexual assault looks like and how to kind of use your voice kind of going forward? Well, and also what sexual assault doesn't look like. Right. So, I mean, you brought it up yourself, there's this, public perception of stranger danger, right? It's the person that's coming up to you and is gonna assault you that you don't know. But the vast majority of sexual abuse cases, the person knows their perpetrator. They know the person who's doing this to them. And so really through our interviews with child advocates, there's a, you know, first of all, if somebody comes to you with these allegations, believe them. That's step one. And number two, report it. Almost every state has some sort of mandatory reporting law. In Indiana, as an example, it's a universal mandatory reporting law. That means that it doesn't matter who you are, what position you hold, whether or not you work with children, but if you have reason to believe a child is being abused or neglected, you are required by law to report it to authorities immediately. That doesn't mean when I get around to it or a week or a month later. It means immediately. And there have been cases in which people have been charged for failure to report because in one case he waited four hours. So it's really important because police and the Department of Child Services can't investigate something they don't know about. So believe the people who are coming to you and report it as required by law. What do you think are some of the reasons why someone wouldn't report? Do you think it has to do with the person themselves or you know, maybe just not understanding? It's incredibly complex. There's a lot of reasons that people don't report. If you're the survivor, you're not in a place maybe where you're comfortable reporting your story. In Larry Nassar's case, a lot of people didn't know that what happened to them was abuse until after our reporting came out because they thought that, again, he was a doctor and that what he was doing was okay. 
I also think that for parents in some cases, what we found through our investigation was that they were concerned about the rigors of a criminal trial, the impact that would have on their child, and in some cases their child was very young. And so they didn't want to report because they didn't want to further traumatize their children who'd already been traumatized. And then for gym owners and for other coaches, what they told us was, quite frankly, they were afraid of what was going to happen to their business if they reported this to authorities because if there's an article that's talking about the abuse that happened in their gym, yeah. They may lose. It's a PR con nightmare. Yeah, it's a PR nightmare, right? And and so there's a lot of reasons that people don't report, um, even when they should. Mm -hmm. So then, when moving forward, do you think that there's that this coverage and this was widely covered? I think everyone knows of it. It's something that's going to stick with people for the rest of their lives. Whether you're a victim survivor, whether you're a gymnast in general or just a regular public, how do you think that this media coverage specifically is going to, do you think it's going to change kind of moving forward how these policies are seen and how people kind of react to situations like this? I hope so. As a result of our investigation, there's a new federal law that requires mandatory reporting for national governing bodies, which was not in place before. Um, but. It's important to know that as much as we talk about Larry Nassar and the attention that the Larry Nassar case has gotten, he is one guy and one example of a broader systemic problem. And so it's really about how people are going to move forward and whether they're going to report and how they're going to handle these allegations when they come up, because they will come up. Sexual abuse, child sexual abuse, is not a gymnastic specific problem. It's not a youth sports problem, it's pervasive, it's everywhere, and so that responsibility doesn't just fall within this segment that we've been investigating, it's really everywhere. Yeah, definitely. I think, lastly, is there anything that you would want people, obviously report when you can, but people who maybe are, are still afraid to use their voice, can you talk about any sort of the power that has come, that you've seen come through of people, like Jeff kind of mentioned, finding this and recognizing that their voice is so powerful, more powerful than they've been told it is? Well, again, it's such a personal decision, and I don't want to in any way make somebody feel like they need to share their story. It's their story. They own that story. Um, but I hope that we're in a climate now and we're moving forward as a society in a way that if you do come forward, that you will be believed and that there are people who want to hear what you have to say. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, well, thank you. Uh, can we first give uh, Marissa an initial round of applause? Thank yeah. you very much. And now we'll uh, transition to the question and answer portion. Uh, we, we're very grateful that so many students are here. We know you have questions, so we'd love to have you just come up, uh, approach the mic, and then have that part of the dialogue. So please, whoever would like to come forward, please do so. Come on, guys. I'm ready for hard questions. Hi. My name is Allison, and I'm also a journalism major here at Good Valley. Weird. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I have two questions. So my first one is, do you think your perspective as a female journalist shaped this story in any way? Do you think it would have been reported differently if it was an all-male investigative team for this? Yes. Um, so first of all, my colleagues are immensely talented. So it, it is nothing about them. But you have to understand, I was reporting this with two colleagues who are significantly older than me and are white men, for lack of a better way to describe it. And exactly. so we had them interviewing survivors, interviewing people about the most traumatic experiences that they had in their lives. And so what ended up happening with this investigation was that um, they would do the initial interview with a survivor that they were interviewing, and then I would circle back and I would ask the more explicit questions. And I would talk to them about, are you sure you're comfortable with this level of detail? And I'd read them pieces of their experiences to make sure that they were comfortable with the level of detail that was involved. Because for us, it was really important that people understood that this was not a slip of the hand in spotting or a mistake one time, that it was a very deliberate act. And so we used much stronger, more explicit language than we traditionally would in a piece like this. That leads me more into my next question, too. So what are some of the ways that your team um, helped to make these survivors feel comfortable sharing their story? That's a great question. So every I do a lot of reporting on sensitive issues like this, and I handle every interview the same way with a survivor. 
the first thing that I do is I say, this is what we're working on. We want you to understand why we want to talk to you, how it fits into the broader picture of what we're doing. And then before I ask a single question, I ask them if they have any questions. And I give them the opportunity to express any concerns or air any things that they want to talk about. And then I also make it clear before I ask any questions that if I ask them something that they're uncomfortable with, that they don't have to answer it. It's their story, they own it, and really they have no obligation to share that detail with me. But I also explain why I want that detail and why I'll be asking those questions because, again, we wanted to make sure the public completely understood what was going on. And so even after the process was done, so the, all of that happens before I ask a single question. Then we do the interview and the conversation doesn't stop there. So we continue to keep in touch with all of the survivors and say, hey, we wanna let you know, this is where we're at with the story. This is when you might be able to expect it to come out. And then we circle back again and say, again, are you sure, you know, now that you've had time to think about it, not in the moment, are you sure that you are comfortable with this level of detail being included in publication? And just to give that last check and make sure that they are comfortable. And in every single case, they never had us back off of language. We here at West Side Stories applaud Kwiatkowski and the Indy Star team for their excellence in reporting this important story. It truly shows how local reporting can make a national impact. That's all the time we have for this week's show. I'm Reagan Blissett. And don't forget to tune in next week to see more on this story.